I heard the audio and we have begun recording. Okay, great. Class is officially started. Oh, much less people than I expected. That's fine. All right, let's, we're gonna first talk about the exam. Uh, and uh, before I forget, uh, there is an extra credit opportunity attached to the exam, uh, a new one that will let you know the details of after we complete it. First and foremost, uh, the extra credit questions you can see refer to specific problems. So we'll go through those when we reach. Multiple choice first, I think as a whole, this was a, a well-performed section. Uh, some of the mistakes made here, I think were uh, somewhat typical. So for example, right here, if you put this into the calculator, I think you actually, if I remember correctly, it's something like 1.08 times 10 to the 14. In fact, uh, I know the number may not be exactly correct, but the point is that none of these quite match that. So the answer was simply none of these. Uh, how many significant figures is the number that contain? There was an exact question, similar question like this on the practice exam. Let's talk about how, what we would identify. Two, six, five, and two, clearly they are all significant digits. The matter is the zeros. The zeros to the left of a non-zero digit are called leading zeros, which are not significant. The, the last, the very far right zero is after a decimal point and after a non-zero number. In this case, it is after two. Therefore, that zero counts as significant. In total, there are five significant things. In cylinder, um, in a cylinder, there are three layers of liquids, chloroform, mercury, and bromine. Given this, above which layer would a solid object float? Again, this question was uh, taken almost verbat verbatim from the practice exam. I just deleted two of the layers. Uh, <clears throat> how you should have investigated was you, you can draw a very sort of mock cylinder like so. We recall that uh, the less dense fluid is on top versus the more dense. In that same way, we can actually organize the layers as follows. If the less dense is at the top, that means the lowest density is the one on top. In this case, it is chloroform. So the one on top is chloroform. And I'll put the number two so you can easily see it, 1.49. Following that, mercury. Wait, no, not mercury. Uh, bromine, which is 3.12. And then finally, mercury. Yes? No, it's top left corner. It says recording. Yeah. No worry. I did check. It's because I accidentally set my iPad as host. Thank you for checking. Uh, the mercury given to us is 13.59. We are told that the solid object is 3.43. So it is most likely going to be located. Let me use a different color. Somewhere right here. Upon identifying that it's somewhere between bromine and mercury, it must float on top of mercury. Okay. Uh, if a substance boils at 137, melts at 121, what is its physical state? We can sort of draw a scale to help us visualize this. Uh, it says at 121, it melts. And at 137, it boils. Given these terms, we know melting is solid to liquid. And then finally, liquid to gas is how boiling works. So the question is asking us, what is our physical state at 138? Since that is located right here, it is a gas. What is the volume of an object that weighs 405.678 milligrams with a density of 3.646? For the most part, I think people got this, for, they remember the formula correctly. They were able to get from the density formula to give us volume equal mass over density. The issue where people 
where it arose was not recognizing the difference in units. Milliliters are consistent, so you don't need to do a conversion on that, but recognize that here you have milligrams and here you have grams. Upon doing the conversion, the final answer becomes C. So in other words, people did the math right. They just used the wrong number if they made a mistake here. Uh, express a number uh, right here in standard scientific notation. Uh, this involves moving the decimal point, number of jumps, so that it is between 1 and 10. In this case, it is 3.45. That is, of course, common to all of the answers, three, four, five, those numbers, right? Uh, but of course, you must remember the decimal must be between two numbers or two digits such that it is less, uh, it is between one and 10. With that, we have jumped a total of one, two, three, four times. And based on the direction we went, it must be negative. As a result, the answer is B. Uh, identify the most electronegative element below. Uh, electronegativity can be described as how much an element loves electrons. So basically I'm asking you of these options here, which one of them loves electrons the most? Looking at the individual forms, nitrogen, cesium, and chlorine, and you have fluorine as well. If you look at the periodic table, uh, fluorine will be the most electronegative it's, as it's to the top right corner. As a reminder, electronegativity increases going across and increases going up. Mistakes I usually saw here were people either going the opposite direction. Maybe you just forgot the exact trend and you put cesium as a result the other end. Okay. The molecular formula for aluminum sulfite. We know that aluminum is in group three, therefore it's three plus. Sulfite is one of your polyatomic ions. It is SO3 two minus. SO4 is sulfate. The crisscross method leads you to have Al2 SO3 three. That leads us to A. What state of matter has a defined volume and takes the shape of its container? I think this one was a pretty popular, easy question. Liquid. Which ion is most likely formed by oxygen? Oxygen is in group six, therefore it is most likely to form a two negative charge. Your answer is C. What is the molecular formula of palladium phosphate? All right, so palladium is on the periodic table. It is a transition metal, it is number uh, 46, if you guys want to quickly find it. Since it's a transition metal, well, we'd have to have some information that tells us what the charge is. Fortunately, we do. We have the Roman numerals right there. So that's how we know that this is palladium 2 plus. Phosphate is one of the polyatomic ions. It is PO4 3 minus. The resulting formula, which is uh, crisscrossed, is palladium 3 PO4 Two, which in this case is A as an apple. Identify a substance that is liquid at room temperature. The only one here that meets that requirement is bromine. If we quickly pay attention to the periodic table. The font color tells us about states. Uh, black, black font is metal, red font is uh, gas, and blue is liquid. You can see that only bromine, 35, and mercury are liquids. What is the approximate atomic mass of a carbon isotope with seven neutrons? You should know the formula that number of neutrons is equal to the mass minus the number of protons. We are trying to find mass. So we arrange this to get mass is equal to the number of neutrons plus the number of protons. We're told it's seven, and we know in general carbon has six. The answer is 13. Okay. What is the name of the polyatomic ion SO42 minus? 
this, this particular question kind of goes hand in hand with this up here because it requires you to be able to distinguish. Uh, SO4 2 minus is simply labeled sulfate. The process of turning a liquid into a gas is called evaporation. Across the board, this question was really well performed. I think uh, you all really practiced this well. There were very few mistakes here, so I'm not gonna go through this table. It's really just reading the periodic table. Uh, but let me just talk about some, some few mistakes that I saw. First, recognize that, please read the columns. I think people were so, so, uh, were so much expecting the exact table that they didn't read the columns. So instead of giving me number of neutrons right here, people actually gave me the mass, which is kind of redundant because I've already have a column for mass. Right. Uh, so in that case, you know, just please read the columns next time for a question like this. Uh, most people did correctly identify the relationship between electrons and charge. Uh, the other thing I saw was this one right here. T, this is actually TL for thallium. I noticed that some people may have read it as TI for titanium. <clears throat> Understandable mistake. However, since I did tell you the number of protons, which is the atomic number, you could have looked at the periodic table and identified, oh, this is TL. Uh, no other issues here. I think for the, I think I was really really happy with this class performance as a whole on this question. If you have any specific queries related to this, come see me after class. Worked problems. Great. This one was kind of the lowest performing question. Uh, there was a lot going on here. I uh, I I really wanted to be as you know straightforward to the point, but it seems that I did not do as good of a job making the questions as clear as I needed to. So but let me actually point a couple of things out. First and foremost, solve the following questions to two significant figures. I've always maintained that when I ask for it, you are responsible for it. Similarly speaking, if I set a specific amount, it doesn't matter what the rules say because I'm telling you what to set it to. On the practice exam, I had just simply said a correct number, in which case it was dependent on the rules. Again, I think people were so expecting that exact question that they didn't read this one. But two significant figures. Use scientific notation when necessary. This is kind of a hint that you would be using scientific notation. Because notice I said when necessary. If it was, if it was a possibility, I would have said if. Okay. Uh, calculate the density of the metal when submerged in water causes level to rise. Express your answer in grams per liter. There's also a conversion going on here. <coughs> Let's just quickly talk about it. Uh, the density is equal to mass over volume. But of course, the first issue we have is that we need the mass to be in grams. We need the volume to be in liters. That is what the question wants us to do. So that is a good idea to convert first the mass is 1.234 kilograms, which is equal to 1,234 1, 1, grams. You multiply by 1,000. Some people divided. And then for the volume, I told you that the water level changed or it rose. Most people correctly identify that you should have taken the difference of these two numbers. Uh, does anyone have that number off the top of their head or on their paper? 5.96, thank you. This is in milliliters, of course. And then we convert it to milliliters. Uh, you go through, I'm sorry, you convert it to milliliters, which is dividing by a thousand. 0 0.00596 liters. Okay, great. So now we have our individual values in their proper units. We just plug and chug. This gives us one point, sorry, not one point, 1,234 all over 0 0.00596. Put this in your calculator. I, I believe the number was some like big number like this, whatever, whatever crap. 
It is at this point, you should recognize that the question is asking you to do to two significant figures. According to the answer though, if you were to reduce this to two significant figures, uh, this would simply be the following. Because again, to reduce, we go one, sorry, if we, we go one, two, okay, look at the number after it, higher than five, so you round up, so this gives you 21,000. The decimal point is still there, so the decimal point still exists. The problem is since the decimal point is present, this is five significant figures. One of the first things I taught you is if there is no if there is no decimal place, it is ambiguous. You cannot be sure. But the decimal point existed to begin with. It has to be maintained at the end. So the problem is currently this is five significant figures. If you all remember from the workshop day, what happens when this arises? Scientific notation. Do scientific notation when necessary. The final answer becomes 2.1 times 10 to the five. And this is two significant figures exactly. <clears throat> All right, next up, a cup contains whatever pounds of ethanol of that density calculate the volume of the ethanol uh, in liters, okay? So we already know that the formula is density equal mass over volume. We can quickly transpose that to get V is equal to mass over density. Uh, let's be sure that our units make sense. Uh, we have density in grams. However, I've given you the weight in pounds. I've told you the conversion factor, so it is on you to do the conversion. Uh, I have told you that one pound is equal to 453.592. Uh, I want to know how many grams are in 3.72 pounds. If anyone has that answer immediately, could you just shout it out please? It's like 16 something. Is there a decimal point in there? Great, thank you very much. And this is the mass in grams. Okay, that's one big conversion out of the way. Next up, uh, we're given milliliters. Okay, no big worry. Because we just need to calculate that at the end. Putting this all together, the mass is six, uh, 1687.36, you said, yeah, 36. 224, all over the density of 0 0.806. Could, uh, does anyone have the answer? Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's enough decimal place. <clears throat> this is approximately what you should have gotten. Question reminds us, two significant figures. All right, so we go one, two, wait, sorry. This is in milliliters. We must convert to liters. This is 2.09350153 liters. Or to convert it to two significant figures, we go one, two, after the second number is a nine, which means we round up, the final answer is 2.1. All right. Uh, the nomenclature. <clears throat> Previously, when I've taught nomenclature, I've taken a very sort of bird's eye view of it. As a result, uh, we, in previous semesters, we've only ever spent like 20 minutes on naming. This semester, I actually had to, I changed things up, right? Uh, some of you, most of you would not know it, of course. But I gave it a little bit more of a, of a structured guide or step-by-step instruction. Let me, uh, if you, what I'm referring to, let me just go back really quickly. This is enthalpy, okay, nope. Right. When we talked about covalent and ionic, I gave you these in steps. 
I broke it down. I gave you the different options that covalent. What about if it was unknown metal? What if it was known metal? It seems in my effort to course correct, I have overcompensated uh, because I think I gave you guys too much information and it overwhelmed you for this section. The mistakes I saw here was in general sort of confusing the rules. Like you, you weren't sure when to put Roman numerals, you weren't sure when not to and all that stuff. So that is something that I will need to work on when we go into the review process for the, fin uh, for the final. But let's talk about this here. Uh, the answer for this is copper two sulfates. We know that SO4 is two minus. If there's only one of it, the copper must also be two plus. And of course, recognize that this is sulfate, not sulfite. Ammonium phosphate, we know that ammonium is NH4 plus and phosphate is PO4 three minus. Crisscross method gives us NH4 three PO4. Next up, we have this molecule right here, a transition metal. We do not know the charge of the iron just yet. We do know that nitrate is, is negative one, and we know that there are three of them. Based on this, the iron must be three plus. This becomes iron three nitrates. Next up, we have zinc. We're told it's two plus based on the Roman numerals. And then we know phosphide to be P3 minus. It is not phosphate. Phosphide is just simply the phosphorus on the periodic table. Crisscross method leads us to zinc three P2. Next up, we have SF6. The technically correct answer to this is monosulfur hexa fluoride. Traditionally, though, you do not write the mon. Hydrogen sulfide, sulfur is two minus. Hydrogen is plus one. Crisscross gives us H2S. Next up, we have AlNO23. Aluminum is not part of the transition metal block. So we actually know pretty quickly that it is Al3 plus uh, and that NO2 is minus one. There are three of them. So everything's already kind of balanced. You put it all together to give you aluminum nitrite. Not nitrate, nitrite. Aluminum is not a transition metal, so you did not need uh, Roman numerals. Next up, we have chromium three oxide. Chromium is Cr. We're told it's three plus, and we know that oxide is two minus. Crisscross gives us Cr two O three. Here again, no transition metal, so we can just go straight into it. This is simply barium. Sulfite, not sulfate, sulfite. Finally, cobalt is two plus. We know phosphate to be three minus. Crisscross gives us CO3, PO42. Yes. Uh, on this one, most people did, most people did about what I expected. Uh, I would recommend reviewing the lecture that we talked about it because this isn't something for us to solve and I'm not going to go through an explanation. All right. Thermochemistry. This question was really well performed as a whole. I, I, I attributed that to the recency of that topic to the exam. Let's go through it. Uh, following question pertains to the reaction below. Is the reaction exothermic or endothermic? We can tell whether or not the energy value is negative or positive. The negative tells us that this is exothermic. If it is exothermic, then heat is released. If heat is released, temperature goes up. 
all three of them are on the same side. The reaction was carried out in a calorimeter and led to a temperature change of yada in the surrounding water. Calculate the mass of water used and assume that C. <clears throat> the formula is MC delta T, and we are being asked to find the mass. Therefore, we can change the formula around to give us Q over C delta T. We are told what C is. We're given the information for uh, temperature. But have I given you any information about the energy of the reaction? Yes. The Q I've given you is already written up here. That is the energy. So putting this all together, uh, negative 138 kilojoules all over the C, which is 4,182 times a delta T of 12.7, uh, leads you to the final answer. That's just math, doing the math from right there. I think it's around three kilograms. All right, and then in the final question, you were asked to sketch an energy profile for the reaction above, uh, clearly labeling and identifying the following. So first we need our axes. The X axis is labeled as reaction progress, typically in units of time. The Y axis is energy, which is typically in units of kilojoules. There we have our axes. We know the x-axis progresses from zero to whatever. So the far left must be the reactants. I'm just gonna write R for right now. Now we need to know if the products are higher or lower in energy. We have already identified the reaction as exothermic. You can see that from the negative symbol. That is how we know that the products will be lower in energy. And then we just connect them to the hump, like so. All right. Let's see if there's anything else the question would like me to label. I'm going to fill in the reactants and products just at the end. Reactants, products, activation energy. OK, we know that the activation energy is a difference in energy between the highest point and the reactants. So we can just label this as activation energy. We also need to clearly label and identify the enthalpy of the reaction. The enthalpy of the reaction is a difference in energy between the reactant and products. And this is specifically 138 kilojoules, negative. I, uh, I took it a bit easy on people. If all you did was just write the word enthalpy, I had hoped that you would explicitly write the number. Uh, but if you only wrote the word enthalpy, I gave you half credit. And now to finish it off, let's fill in our reactants and products looking at the reaction. We have NO2 and H2O as the reactants. Then we have HNO3 plus O2. Is it O2? Oh, NO, oops. NO as the, uh, as the product. I encourage you to spend some time with your, uh, with your exam, just going over it, seeing what mistakes you made. If, uh, if I made a mistake in, your, in grading, please let me know as soon as possible. I'm more than happy to correct it if I made a mistake. Uh, you're also, if you want explanation on why you got certain points, I'd rather you email me so I can type out a proper response, but you can also talk to me in person. Does everyone have any questions on this exam before we move on? Okay. All right, the extra credit opportunity for this exam. It is an opportunity to get 10 points added to your raw score, 10 points. Over the past couple of weeks, we have been doing these worksheets. Right on Thursdays, we've been coming here and doing all of them together. We've done one for scientific figures and notation. Sci yeah, significant figures and notation. We've done one for the periodic table. We've done one for nomenclature. And most recently we did one for thermochemistry. To qualify for this extra credit, 
please complete each packet. Each completed packet will give you two and a half points. If you complete all four, you get 10 points. It does not need to be correct. It just needs to be complete. Yes. Let's say Sunday. What? Yes, I'll, uh, I'll, send, I'll put out a Canvas announcement as well, but uh, they're right here under lecture recordings. They're under, you'll see them labeled under problem solving session. So I've uploaded the relevant worksheet to that problem solving session there for. We have scientific notation and significant figures, periodic table, nomenclature, and thermochemistry. Complete it all you get 10 points. Complete only one, two and a half points. That's how it works. Yes. Ten? Yeah. I'd give you the 110 if you really want it. Anyone have any questions on what extra credit is going to look like? We've already done most of the worksheet, remember, in class. So really and truly, I'm just asking you to just finish it, not start from scratch. All right, I will, I will make a Canvas assignment for you to upload. Like I said, every complete packet is two and a half points. You complete all four, that's 10. Complete three, that's 7.5 and so forth. All right. Considering how much we've already completed of the individual packets, there should be no reason why everyone isn't able to submit. All right. Now we're moving on to the next topic. Yeah, I'll send out a proper Canvas announcement with all the details, but you guys get advanced. That's one. Take one and pass it around. A big packet is coming around, two packets. You must take one and pass it around. Since you write it, take one and pass it around. Take one and pass it around. We can start from over here. Everyone should have two handouts. Give everyone a second. Oh, right. I forgot to do the extra credit. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, we'll do, we'll talk about that really quickly once we've handed out all the pages. Sorry, I completely forgot to talk about the extra credit. Two sheets of paper, two tables, one with a whole lot of text, one with less text. Yeah, extras. All right, is there anyone who does not? Okay, yeah. No. Is there anyone who does not have the re Oh, you guys, okay. let's pass it around then. Yes. Two sheets, one labeled solubility rules and one that has reaction type as one of the columns. Two tables, two sheets of paper. One of them should be the reactions that you have, and the other one is called solubility rules. I think that one's coming up over here. I'll come for the extras in a bit. While it's still passing around, let me just talk about the extra credit. <clears throat> Thank you for reminding me, Margaret. All right, so first of all, the first extra credit question is asking us, for problem 3A, would the metal describe float or sink? <clears throat> Unfortunately, if you got 3A wrong you, and you attempted this one, you may have gotten it wrong as well. So we are told, uh, we overall find out that the density of the particular uh, metal is, you know, like 21,000 something, right? What do we know about oil? We may not remember the exact value for oil, but we know that oil floats on top of water which means it is less than one. So where would this metal object go? Would it go above oil or under? 
Which one is less dense? The object or the oil? Oil, right? So oil on top of the metal, which otherwise means that the metal would sink. Uh, and then the next question was asking us to identify which ones are ionic, which ones are covalent. Uh, to qualify for that particular extra credit, you had to get them all correct. Uh, copper sulfate is ionic. Ammonium phosphate is covalent. Iron nitrate is ionic. Zinc is ionic. Sulfur hexafluoride is covalent. Hydrogen sulfide is covalent. Aluminum nitrite is ionic. Chromium oxide is ionic. Barium sulfide is ionic. And cobalt is also ionic. So there were, there were only three covalent cases. All right, do we have the extras ready? Okay. All right, everyone got two handouts, two tables, one labeled solubility rules and the other labeled with reaction. Okay, fantastic. All right, with this, we are gonna start module exam two content. Okay, we are going to start with chapter six, reactions. All right. Reactions take on many different forms, many different types. The forms, let me see if I can draw that properly, are in no particular order synthesis, decomposition, and finally displacement. These are the generic forms that a reaction might take. And they follow the following generic examples. In the case of synthesis, synthesis can be th thought of as two reactants coming together and combining. Using the generic letters A and B, they will combine and, combine and form AB. Decomposition is the opposite, where a single reactant breaks down into individual products. Please note some of the terminology I've used. The right-hand side is referred to as the product side. And the left-hand side is referred to as the reactant side. The arrow tells us the direction. In the case of displacement, there are actually two types. In the first one, single displacement. This occurs when an element displaces another element that is already within a compound. In other words, when A reacts with BC, you form AC plus B. Here's a good question. Considering what we know about traditional charge rules and left and right, if A has replaced B, is A a cation or an anion? Or rather, which one is it going to form? Let me repeat, based on everything we know about how ions and formulae are written, if A replaced B, is A going to be 
positive or negatively charged? Positively charged. Because the left is always going to be the cation. In other words, this occurs when A becomes a cation. The other possibility is forming BA plus C. And in this case, A is an anion. Two forms of this particular reaction, dependent on whether or not the single element will form a cation or an anion. Yeah, I'll zoom out a bit. These generic forms are to aid you when we start predicting products. Can I go on to the next page now? Yeah, great. The other type of displacement is called double displacement. The double displacement form goes as AB plus CD gives us AD plus CB. In double displacement, the compounds basically just pull a switcheroo. I like to point out a couple of things here. In the product side, we have AD. I've written it in that order. If it's AD, that means that A is a cation and D is a cat an anion. Is that true on the left-hand side? Yes. Yes. So I've maintained consistency. That's what I'd like to point out. D started off anion. It ends up anion. It's written last or second. Similarly speaking, Look at CB, kind of should throw people off. It's not alphabetical order. But remember, on the reactant side, C is a cation and B is the anion. And it always goes cation, then anion. The double displacement form is actually the most common form. To the point where I actively encourage you to memorize this form. AB plus CD gives you AD plus CB. I've even helped you out. At the bottom of this table, so the reaction types at the very bottom, I have it written as displacement. I have three generic reactions. I have the notes beside it that says when A forms a cation. And under the comment section, it says these generic reactions are used to predict products. For the next couple of lectures, I highly encourage you to continue to bring this particular sheet back to class. It'll be a quick, quick reference for us. That's double displacement. Okay. One example of a reaction is H2 plus Cl2 to give us HCl. Based on the forms we just talked about, this follows the synthesis rule, the synthesis format. And that is also on the table. If you don't want to skip back on your uh, notes, the very first row says synthesis. All right, H2 plus CO2 to give us HCl. Now, yes. Yes. Oh, that's a typo. I'll correct it. Thank you. Yeah, maybe maybe when it went through autocorrect, probably correct because it was an alphabet. Thank you. So uh, what she is referring to is the very last row. It says A B plus C D gives us A D plus B C. I've mixed. I I have it wrong. It should be what I have here. Thank you for that, sir. I'll correct it and upload it tonight. Thank you. Okay. Let's talk about what this reaction right here is telling us. 
It is a synthesis reaction. It tells us that hydrogen and chlorine come together and they form HCl. We know the law of conservation of matter broadly. It states that matter can neither be created nor destroyed, just transferred. So there is a flaw with this currently written reaction. On the left-hand side, we're claiming to have two hydrogens. Similarly, we're claiming to have two chlorines. That's what those subscript numbers mean, remember? That is how many of those elements slash ion there are. But on the product side, there's only one of each. This is the problem. Because where did those additional ones go? If we put a two in front of the HCl, however, it makes it clear, oh, there's actually two of these in total. Therefore, there are two hydrogens and two chlorines. This is what's known as a balanced reaction. A balanced reaction includes numbers that keep atoms, elements, compounds, whatever, consistent. Let's try another one. Na plus Cl2 gives us NaCl. All right, looking at the reactant side, we see that we have only one sodium and we have two chlorines. On the product side, we have only one sodium and only one chlorine. This is how I encourage you to, at the beginning, sort of use, write this out like, uh, write this out as I am. It sort of helps you organize your thoughts. Nothing is wrong with the sodium. It's balanced. There's one on either side, but clearly the issue lies with the chlorine. If there's two chlorines on the left, we need to do something to the product side to balance it. What do we do? Well, we just put a two in front of it. Yeah, that fixes our problem. Now we have two chlorines. But it introduces a new problem. Now we have two sodiums. But we can balance that by just putting a two on the reactant side. Now, all of a sudden, you have two sodiums on both sides. So balancing the reaction, balancing the equation can go on either side. No matter, not every single molecule will have a number in front of it. Some of them will, some of them won't. But you must include these big numbers at the front to balance the equation. Uh, let's try another one. Uh... Let's do the predict the products together. Looking at these compounds given here, you should be able to identify all the ions that are present. From left to right, we have copper two plus, sulfur two minus, H plus, and Cl minus. These are all the ions present. One, two, three, four. A, B, plus C, D. You need to be able to match the relevant formula to what the generic equation represents. So just having it right up here, uh, A, B, plus C, D. It gives us uh, uh, A, D, plus C, B. That is a generic reaction. We're going to use a generic reaction to tell us the actual reaction. First and foremost, what is A? It is copper. What is D? It is chlorine. So AD forms copper and chlorine. Just like that, that's how I'm writing. We make this in the white space. 
All right. Next up, we have CB, that is H and S. Don't forget, you have to maintain consistency in the cation and anion naming, right? <clears throat> you have to write the hydrogen first. We're not done just quite yet because all we've done is use the generic reaction to sort of give us a starting point. Now we need to make sure that the formulae make sense. I'll show you what I mean. What is the charge of the copper over here on the left? Two plus. We know that it is two plus because sulfur is usually two minus. The copper stays two plus, but chlorine is negative one. So how many chlorines should I actually have? Two. So this is CuCl2. I only need two of the chlorine to balance out the charges. That's why I would not put it in the front. Finally, in the case of HS, we know that sulfur again is two minus. We know that hydrogen is plus. Crisscross method gives you H2S. So it's, it's a kind of like a, it's a step-by-step -step process. First, using the generic reaction, you predict the products. Then you make sure they make sense. Use a crisscross method. All right, let's try to balance this reaction. On the left-hand side, we have copper, sulfur, hydrogen, and chlorine. Same thing on the left. <clears throat> As of right now, we have one copper, one sulfur, one hydrogen, one chlorine. On the right-hand side, we currently have one copper, one sulfur, two hydrogens, two chlorines. All I have done is just represented what we've already figured out, presented in a like sort of a list. According to the left and right side, copper and sulfur, they're both balanced. No worries about that. We're good. But the hydrogen and Cl are not balanced. Does anyone have a guess what one simple thing we need to do to balance this? Where? H and the Cl, very good. What she's saying is that you just simply need to put a two in front of the HCl. In doing so, you have fixed your issue. Two, two. It's important to think of these balancing or these numbers sort of like you would in a recipe. Just as how the cookie mix calls for a quarter cup of olive oil, you know, we're saying in this reaction, we need two HCl. So what does this tell us about ratios? All right, well, I'm just gonna copy this back again. So we have it. According to the balanced equation, the ratios are one to two, one to one. How this is to be read is just like you would in cooking recipes, for every one copper sulfide, you need two HCl. For every one egg, you need two sticks of butter. So what does that tell us? That tells us we can change stuff. What if, what if, we had three copper sulfates. How many HCLs would we need, copper sulfides? Let's try this again. Think of the reaction like as you would as a recipe. The numbers, one to two, tell us for every one copper sulfide, you need two HCL. This is equivalent to saying for every one egg, you need two sticks of butter. So what if you have three eggs? How many sticks of butter do you need? So if you have three copper sulfides, how many HCl do you need? Six. 
Let's keep it going. According to this balanced reaction, the copper chloride right here is one to one with copper sulfide. If this were a recipe, what number would I put right here? Three. Let's do this another way. For every one egg, you get one omelet. If you have three eggs, you will make three omelets. Think of it like you would cooking. The numbers in front just represent ratios. What I'm trying to say here is that if you were to provide me the following equations, three copper sulfide plus six HCl to give me three copper chloride plus three H2S, that would still be correct. Even though these two equations as written are wildly different in terms of numbers, they're both correct because they maintain the same ratio. In both cases, one to two copper sulfide to HCl. In this case down here, again, one to two. Since there's a lot of freedom with this, we typically do not use fractions when we're balancing. We try to avoid it as much as possible. It makes it more confusing than need be. <clears throat> do we have any questions on balancing? Yes. Thermochemistry, yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, so what Sarah is referring to, I'm just going to bring it up for everyone's benefit, is when we covered thermochemistry, I don't have the, uh, the written answer is here, but if you recall when we did some of these Hess's Law stuff, remember the code was we put it down, flip it, and reverse it, right? If you multiply the reaction by three, you multiply the energy by three. That's exactly what Sarah is referring to. Uh, yeah. Cool. So now that we understand a little bit more about reactions and how to represent them, we find ourselves curious about one last thing. So we're coming back to the first equation we balanced. I know how much of each hydrogen and chlorine I need. I know that this is a one-to-one -one ratio. I know that if this works out, I'll be making two HCl. But I don't know how I'm going to make this. Is this going to be a dry mix, a wet mix? I don't know what state these elements are in. I don't. So that's what we're trying to go figure out now. H2 is hydrogen gas. Does anyone want to take a guess what the state for hydrogen gas is? Gas. That is represented as G in brackets. In the same vein, chlorine is also a gas. Therefore, it is G as well. These are what are known as state symbols. In no particular order, they are solid. That's an L for liquid. G for gas. And a new one, AQ. This is aqueous. Give you a second to write that down, and then we will talk about what aqueous means, and then we'll go back to the equation. I believe some people pronounce it aqueous. I don't think, uh, I don't know if it's actually a correct one. Okay. This is the first time you're hearing of the term aqueous. And now I'm presenting it to you as a state symbol. This does not mean that aqueous is a state of matter. Talk, this is two separate things. What does aqueous mean? Well, in short, Aqueous means dissolvable.
If you've ever made lemonade, you've had to use lemon juice, right? Or lime juice, I don't remember which one it is. The lime juice itself is a liquid, but you're gonna put it in your water mix, right? You're gonna swirl it around and then it dissolves. In that way, the lime juice is aqueous. It can dissolve in a solution. In most chemical reactions, most reactions are carried out in water. In water. So the word aqueous tells us that this chemical is able to dissolve in water, in the medium. Just as lime juice or lemon juice is dissolved in your water for lemonade, these chemicals can also be dissolved in water. I would like for everyone to now refer to the solubility rules table. The solubility rules table guides you through how to identify whether a molecule is soluble, or I'm sorry, aqueous or not. You are expected to memorize this table, the solubility rules. The reaction sheet is just a guide. It isn't something I need for you to memorize. It's just a reference sheet for you to use. But I do expect you to memorize the solubility rules. All right. Let's apply what we know to the above example. We're going to read through the, the, the solubility rules by column. First column states, if the compound contains A, looking at the molecule HCl, where actually it contains a Cl minus. Now we're looking at the second row. If the compound contains a chlorine, then it is aqueous, except when bonded to one of those exceptions. This is neither Ag nor Pb, therefore it is aqueous. Look at the table, read along with the columns. If the compound contains A, now we're looking at the second row, Cl minus, Br minus, I minus. If the compound contains one of those, then it is aqueous. The exceptions are when it's bonded to Ag or Pb. Let me bring it up in case some people are trying to, can't find it on the actual document. Where is it, where is it, where is it? Solubility rules. I'm referring to right here. All right. This is the table that you, uh, you only, this is the only table you need to identify if something is aqueous or solid. These are the only elements that I will ask for. These are the only exceptions I will test you on. So you are expected to memorize this table. Okay. Let's do it for the other ones that we balanced. Let's do it for this one right here. I would like everyone to refer to their individual sheets. All right, first and foremost, going from left to right, let's start with copper sulfide. If the compound contains a sulfide, so we're looking at the last row, then it is insoluble. The only exceptions are when it's bonded to strontium, barium, calcium, or a group one cation. None of those are met. Therefore, this molecule is salt. HCl, we've actually just covered this, but let's go through it again. It has a chlorine. Therefore, it is soluble. It is aqueous. And this is not an exception. So also AQ. Moving on, copper chloride, looking at the same rules. The compound contains a chlorine, therefore it is aqueous. This is not an exception. And I am here today to tell you that H2S is a gas. You would not have known that otherwise. I am telling you that it's a gas. 
you're wondering like, wait, is it, doesn't it follow the rules here? I'm just telling you that normally it's, it's uh, uh, not boiling point. It's boiling point is so low, it naturally exists as a gas at room temperature. So it's specifically labeled as a gas. These state symbols allow us to identify if there are any visceral changes in a reaction. For example, if we were to react NaOH and HCl, let's now predict the products. Let's go by our AB rule from left to right. We identify A, B, C, D gives us A, D plus C, B. Notice I've written the letter under the ion it reflects. AD is sodium chloride. CB is HOH. Do your best to just double check yourself. Sodium is positive one, chlorine is negative one. It's fine. No subscripts needed. HOH, you can uh, simplify that further to become H2O. Going through the solubility rules. Uh, if the compound contains, starting from left, we have OH, which is a hydroxide. If the compound contains an OH, then it is solid, except when bonded to a group one cation. So NaOH is one of the exceptions. Therefore, this is aqueous. HCl, also aqueous. NaCl, also aqueous. And H2O is probably the only compound that's a liquid, that is through and through a liquid. It is aqueous, yeah. So if we read the table, yes. oh. if we uh, read the table, it says, if the compound contains an OH, then it is solid, except when bonded to a group one cation. Yeah. Correct. So you can, Regard it as, you know, SROH2, uh, NaOH, KOH, just all the combinations that can happen with these exceptions. Yep. Yeah. Great. Now that we've covered a little bit more about how to represent reactions, the correct way to write them, that is with balancing and with state symbols, we can now start next topic, types of reactions. I don't know what happened there. Okay, I'm gonna delete that page later. So earlier we did forms of reactions. That's what's used to help us predict products. Now we're actually gonna talk about specific types. That is what's not on the first handout. So that's the guide that we're gonna go through in a bit. Number one. Combustion. This is the third row on the reaction type handout. Combustion. Combustion is a very explicit reaction in which a compound containing of X amount of carbon and Y amount of hydrogen reacts with O2 and will always form carbon dioxide, and water. Always. Anytime any molecule of this form, where X and Y can be any number, reacts with O2 as an oxygen, it will always form CO2 and H2O. An example of this 
is CH4 plus O2 to give us CO2 and H2O. I am here today to tell you that in general, all of these types of chemicals are aqueous. Those CX, the CXHY chemicals, they're generally aqueous. All right. So filling in the state symbols, at AQ, O2, which is a gas, you should recognize carbon dioxide as a gas. And of course, water is the only one ever represented as liquid. Now we need to be sure the reaction is balanced. Okay. On the left, we have C, H, and O. On the right, we have C, H, and O again. We have one, four, and two. I'm just writing down how many of each atom we have. On the right, we have one carbon, two hydrogens, and three oxygens. Give everyone a second to just write that down. All right. <clears throat> Balancing. Uh, to be quite honest, it really doesn't matter what element you start with, right? Because you're eventually going to do them all. But in general, I recommend doing some of the more unique atoms. And what do I mean by unique? Oxygen is in both products. It is not unique. Hydrogen is only in one product. Carbon is in only one product. So I can start with one of those. Let me start with carbon. There's one carbon on the left. There's one carbon on the right. Check. Let's do hydrogen. There are four hydrogens on the left. There are two on the right. That's a problem. What do I need to do to make them equal? Put a two where? On the H2O or in the CH4? H2O. Let me use a different color to make it clear. Now, in doing so, I have increased the number of hydrogens to two. I'm sorry, to four. But there's a problem. What did I also do unintentionally? I increased the number of oxygens. The two in front says that there are two of that molecule, which means in total, there is now four oxygens on the right. Don't get scared though. Is that a, is that a question about what we just did? Oh, um, all right, let's erase it. How many, um, oops. how many oxygens are currently here? Three. So if I put a two right here, how many oxygens do we have on the right? Two plus two. Yeah. Okay. All right. So far, carbon is balanced. Hydrogen is now balanced. Doing good. Finally, we have oxygen. What do we need to do to oxygen to balance the equation? On the left or on the right? So you see, it didn't matter which one we started with. Throughout balancing, we will either unintentionally balance or ruin something. Trust your gut, trust the process. By the end, it'll balance everything. Oxygen was one of the hardest ones to balance because it was not unique. It was the simplest one at the end. Let's try another example. C3H8 plus 2O2 gives a, oh shit, I'm copying that number right now. CO2 plus H2O. Must include our state symbols. And now we're going to balance this reaction. Okay. On the left-hand side, we have three hydrogens and three carbons, eight hydrogens and two oxygens. On the right-hand side, we have one carbon, two hydrogens and three oxygens. All we've done is simply write down what we know, write down what we see. 
doesn't matter which one you start from. But like I said, it's better to start from a unique one. So either carbon or hydrogen. I'm going to start with carbon this time. We have three carbons on the left. We have one carbon on the right. To balance it, we put three on the right. but I've done something unintentionally. I've also increased the number of oxygens. We put three in the front, so now there's six over here and there's still one right here. That means in total we have seven. Trust your gut, trust your process, it will work out. Carbon is balanced, we're good to go. Moving on to hydrogen. Currently there are eight on the left and two on the right. We just put a four in front of the H2O. This balances it. But lo and behold, again, by putting a four in front, now I'm saying that there's four more oxygens. So now in total, there's six oxygens here and four oxygens here for a total of 10. Who cares though? Carbon is balanced, hydrogen is balanced. Next up is oxygen. Let's put a five. The trick to combustion or how I would ask you about combustion or rather what I'm looking for is balancing. I've told you that combustion will always lead to CO2H2. There is no predicting the products. Those are the products. But they're really good opportunities for me to ask if you can balance it. Because I can get really cool. I can say, what about C10H22? If you look at the table, combustion row, the examples I gave are very similar to the ones that we just did. Maybe a slight difference here and there. All right. That is combustion. Let's move on to the next one. We have precipitation. Precipitation involves the formation of an insoluble solid and when I say solid, I quite literally mean like solid chunk. <clears throat> Should not have other brackets. AKA precipitates. From aqueous reactants. Precipitation is the formation of an insoluble solid, which is formed from aqueous reactants. Let's do an example of this. AgNO3 plus NaCl. All right, this is, the, this is the starting point. These are the starting reactions. Let's predict the products together. Let's do this whole thing. We match it to A, B, plus C, D, double displacement. We know that our final answer is going to be A, D, plus C, B. Putting all of this together, A, D is A, G, C, L. And then we have N, A, N, O, 3. Does anyone have any issues seeing how I got those particular combinations? Now we've just matched the combinations. We just want to make sure the charges make sense. Going through them, we see that chlorine is negative one. We know that Ag is plus one. That's that's fine. NO3, we know it to be negative one. We know sodium to be plus one. So that's fine. So sometimes you will, you will immediately happen upon the correct formula just by doing the A, B plus C. All right, with that other way, <clears throat> Let us now balance the equation. I want to do the state symbols last. According to this, there is one silver on the left, one on the right, check. One nitrate on the left, one nitrate on the right, check. One sodium, one sodium, 
check. One chlorine, one chlorine, check. But no further balancing is needed. They're all one to one to one. Worked out for us really great. Now it comes time to do determine the solubility, determine the state. Let's get our tables up and ready. First, L, first compound, silver nitrate. If the compound contains an NO3 minus, this is the first row. If the compound contains an NO3 minus, then it is aqueous, no exceptions. So we immediately know that silver nitrate is aqueous. We can actually go a step further and say, we also know that sodium nitrate is also aqueous. Again, look at the first row. If the compound contains an NO3 minus, then it is aqueous, no exceptions. All right, next up, NaCl, second row. The compound contains a chlorine. Therefore, it is aqueous. This is not an exception, AQ. Next up, we have AGCL. Let's look at the second row. The compound contains a chlorine. Therefore, it is aqueous, except when bonded to a AG. This is one of those exceptions. Therefore, this is a salt. So the only way to know if the reaction is a precipitation is you must identify the state symbols. Experimentally, you'll see it. The lab you do next week, you'll be doing types of reactions. You'll be experimenting and playing around with it. So you'll get to see some of these in real time. But notice that we're forming a solid product from aqueous reactants. If for example, if one of those reactants was solid, it is not a precipitation because you're not forming a solid. There's a solid to begin with. There's a solid to end with. Who cares if it's not the same one? So precipitation is only if you form a solid from aqueous species. All right. <clears throat> Let's do another one for good measure. PB NO32 and H I. All oh, right. I'll wait for everyone to write that down. All right, let's see if we can identify our A, B, our C, and D. We know that our final answer is going to be AD plus CB. Matching everyone together, AD, this becomes PBI. CB is H and NO3, this becomes HNO3. All we've done is just match them according to the generic reaction. Now we have to check to be sure that the formula makes sense. One at a time, looking at PBI. From the reactant side, we know that the lead is 2 plus. Therefore, it stays 2 plus in the product. Iodine is in group 7, which means it has a single negative charge. So how many iodines must there be? Two. Next up, let's just check for HNO3 and hydrogen. We know that hydrogen is plus. We know that NO3 is minus 1. It's fine. Nothing else needed. Let's now balance this equation. All right, on the left-hand side, we have the following ions. Please note that I've grouped the NO3. Yes, I've not finished filling this out. I'm just pointing out that this is the, you, you may be wondering why isn't it just nitrogen and just oxygen? Polyatomic ions are grouped together because as you'll see, it'll end up in the same place. So it's a bit easier to regard them as one big unit. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have one PB, we have two nitrates, we have one hydrogen and one iodine. On the product side, we have one lead, we have one nitrate, one hydrogen and two iodines.
I'm going to start with iodine. On the left, there is one iodine. On the right, there is two. I'm just going to put a two in front of the HI. Now I have my iodines balanced, but unintentionally, I have also increased the number of hydrogens. No worries, though. Uh, I'm continuing going up. There are two hydrogens on the left. There's only one on the right. That's an easy fix. I just put a two right there. All right, so now my hydrogens are balanced, okay? But I've also unintentionally increased the number of nitrates. There are now two. Iodine is balanced, hydrogen is balanced. Let's now check NO3. There are two NO3s on the left. There are two NO3s on the right. So due to sweet serendipity, we've already balanced the NO3. There's only one lead here, one lead here. Sweet serendipity, get done. <clears throat> Anyone have any questions on the numbers? Okay, let's now do the state symbols. Starting from left to right, the compound contains a nitrate, therefore it is aqueous, no exceptions. If there's one thing you will remember one year from today, nitrates are always solid. We can do that on the left. We can do that on the right. Because all nitrates are aqueous, no exceptions. We can immediately write down the AQs. Looking at our atomic, our solubility rules for iodine, if the group contains an iodine, it is aqueous. This is not an exception. Yes. Nitrates are soluble. Nitrates are always aqueous. They mean the same thing. Look at the sheet. Soluble. Oh, no, soluble. soluble. I apologize if I misspoke. <clears throat> Where was... All right, okay, yes. Um, the compound contains a iodine. It is aqueous, and this is not an exception, so AQ. The compound contains an iodine, and this is an exception. It's connected to PB. Therefore, this is solid. And we've already taken care of HNO3. Any questions on this? <clears throat> Why does this keep happening? It's weird. I'll fix that later. What the hell? Okay, that's great. Next up. Gas evolution. Anyone want to take a guess what this is? You form a gas. We've actually already done an example like this earlier. That was the example with copper sulfide, HCl, which gives us copper chloride and H2S. In this particular case, I had to tell you that H2S is a gas. There is no other way for you to have known that. The balance, no, it's not balanced. Two right here. Yeah. Here are some examples of known gases. N2, O2, F2, Cl2, Br2, I2, and, uh, and Hg2. These compounds here, are the gases I expect you to know are gases. Otherwise, I have to tell you that they're a gas. Oh, and of course, uh, CO2. How could I forget uh, carbon dioxide? Yes. Br2 being gas, yeah. Uh, yeah, is there anything else? Yeah, I do want to talk about this a little bit more. Uh, ah, 
under gas evolution. Let's talk about H2CO3. When H2CO3 reacts with a molecule such as <clears throat> HCl, wait, not HCl, NaCl, something cool happens. Uh, we have here H2CO, actually, this is not a good example that I want to make the point for. This is not a good example. This one's too complicated. No, I apologize, but let's do another one. Uh, NaHCO3. Come on. NaHCO3 plus HCO. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that the HCO3 molecule is solid. You would not have known that otherwise. And of course, through the solubility rules table, uh, we know that HCL is aqueous. I'm gonna go ahead and also tell you that the products are sodium chloride and H2CO3. All I've done right now is just given you an example that specifically involves H2CO3. NaCl is aqueous, H2CO3 is also aqueous. Something weird happens when H2CO3 is formed in a laboratory setting. H2CO3, when it is formed, will immediately decompose to H2O and CO2. H2CO3 will always decompose to H2O and CO2. So the more accurate way to write the reaction above, NaHCO3 solid plus HCl aqueous gives us NaCl aqueous plus H2O plus CO2. And you know those individual state symbols. You cannot stop this from happening. I'm telling you that this is going to happen. So if I put it on an exam, you are responsible for it. This is the only case that something like this happens, an almost immediate decomposition to a gas. And it is all on upon recognizing that H2CO3 is formed, that uh, H2CO3 is formed. Okay. Next, we have neutralization. Neutralization occurs when H2O and an ionic compound is formed. CMPD is my shorthand for compound. An example of this is NaOH plus HCl. If we were to go by our AB plus CD rules, that gives us AD plus CB, we would get NaCl and HOH. Please recognize that HOH is just simply H2O. Filling out the state symbols, we have aqueous, 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 and liquid. Water is formed, and we should be able to identify NaCl as an ionic compound, as ionic is a metal and non-metal. So looking at the periodic table, 
the ionic compound would be the result between one of the, the, the black font elements and one of the other colored elements. Please recognize, for the most part, all of these reactions, neutralization, gas evolution, precipitation, they, identifying them depends on predicting the products. You have to know what the products are to, to distinguish the type of reaction. The only exception to this is combustion. Combustion, you know for sure, will always form CO2 and H2O. So once you see some CH compound with O2, that's combustion. You don't even have to think about it. But for all of the others, the only way for you to have known this was precipitation was to predict the product and then do the state symbols. Similarly, again, to identify this as gas evolution, you need to recognize the products. And here again, for neutralization, you need to identify products. <laughs> So this double displacement technique, this A, B plus C, D is extremely useful, especially if you use it right. So I get in the habit of actively thinking about it because from here on out, we're gonna be doing a lot of reactions. Let's do another one. Let's do H2SO4 plus BaOH2. Labeling our products as A, B plus C, D. We know that the double displacement ends up with A, D plus C, B. Matching the formula, we get H, O, H and B, A, S, O, 4. Check to make sure that the charges make sense. Well, I know that H, O, H is simply water, H, 2, O. That's fine, that's balanced, that's neutral. In the case of barium sulfate, I know that barium is two plus, sulfate is two minus. Charges are fine, so this is fine. We can quickly see that H2O is formed. You should be able to identify barium sulfate as ionic. So that's how we know this is a neutralization. But of course, we also need to include state symbols. From left to right, Starting with H2SO4, we're gonna look at our solubility rules. And we're looking at a third row. The compound contains an SO4 two minus, therefore it is aqueous. There is no exception in this case. Oh wait, yes, there, uh, group one cation. Yes, hydrogen's in group one. It's aqueous. Barium hydroxide, looking at the last row, the compound contains a hydroxide, Therefore, it is solid, except when bonded to barium. So this one is aqueous. And we already know H2O to be the only liquid. And barium sulfate, by the same rule of thumb, is going to be solid. And to balance this equation, I need to put a two in front of the H2O. You can double check why uh, on your own time. Okay. I would like to point out something else about this reaction. According to our definition, we have formed water and an ionic compound. Therefore, this is neutralization. But technically speaking, we have also formed a solid from two aqueous reactants. That's the definition of precipitation. So which one is it? Both. A lot of these reactions have a lot of uh, things in common, right? Uh, the reaction, this particular one, if this was on an exam, you identify it as neutralization, you'd be correct. If you identify it as precipitation, you'd be correct. One specific reaction can cover multiple types. Because take, for example, the gas evolution right here. If we look at the more accurate version of the reaction in which we form H2O and CO2, we've also formed an ionic salt, an ionic compound and water. Technically speaking, this is also neutralization. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of things in common. It's basically a really big Venn diagram. 
for that reason, I'm not going to ask you to identify the type of reaction because one reaction can have multiple answers. But you should be able to recognize. Does that make sense? Cool. All right, that's neutralization. Uh, I would like to leave redox for next time because I would like to devote some sizable amount of time to it. Uh, let me see if there's... All right, let's do some practice questions. Uh, I, what I just said was for the last reaction redox, I think I would need a proper 20 to 30 minutes to go through it. We just don't have that much time left. So let's just do some practice questions based on what we've done, what we've done so far. Let me just get some up. I don't know why that one page keeps having like a copper compound. Nope. The first question is asking you to please balance the following. Okay, we have And you can go ahead and start attempting this while I finish when I finish writing down the rest of the questions. All right, I've uh, put four questions on the board. First one is asking you to balance the given reaction. And then the next question is asking you to predict the products and then complete the equation with state symbols and ensure that it's balanced. It is 10.45. Uh, take 10 minutes to do all of this. I'll be walking around and we'll do the, go through it together as a class.
until you get the hang of it, I will always recommend you do what I did with balancing. Write out all of the elements on each side, with the equal sign and match. Uh, having it written out in the beginning helps your thinking later.
three more minutes. If the balancing is uh, throwing you off, go ahead and skip it and attempt to predict the products. All right, it's 1055. <clears throat> My Apple Pencil got disconnected, so I actually have to come out of the Zoom room. 